Y ahora continuemos a el segundo convidado. El segundo convidado es un catalán nascut a Suiza. Eh, va a néixer a Suiza y es va a doctorar en inmunología a la Universidad de Berna. Durante tres años, eh, 13 años, eh, va a trabajar a la Universidad de Harvard dedicada al estudio de la inmunidad celular en las infecciones virales y al impacto que té la genética del host en la respuesta inmune. Benvingut, eh, doctor Christian Brander. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation and thank you everybody uh, for being here or having logged in. Um, I have six minutes. First of all, <laughs> my apologies for not showing off my rudimentary Catalan or, or Spanish. But I have six minutes uh, to talk about what we try to create, which is an HIV vaccine. And this is something that for the last 30 years people have tried to do. So I'm going to have a tough time to to get across in six minutes what we want to do. Um, I also want to go back, actually, and, and tell you quickly where we stand with HIV infection. You may know that HIV infection nowadays is a treatable disease. People take drugs and they live happily ever after. It uh, doesn't mean that they're not having a shorter life expectancy, but at least the virus can be controlled. The virus is never going to go out of the body. And I think that's adding to the, the image of, of HIV infection nowadays as not as a serious uh, disease as it really is. And I think I cannot get tired, especially warning younger generations that HIV infection is and continues to be a problem uh, for society and for everybody in it. In fact, if I don't go massively over time, within six minutes, globally, there will be another 50 people infected every six minutes. So these are millions every year, and currently there are 35 million people living with HIV infection. We also know that we can take some of those antiretroviral drugs, and we can protect ourselves from becoming infected. And that is associated with quite high costs, of course, because those antiretrovirals cost a lot of money and has added a lot to the discussion uh, within the field of, of who should pay for this kind of very effective uh, prevention strategies. At the end of the day, so I think what we really need is a preventive HIV vaccine, as we have for polio and for other diseases. But for that, we face a major or a number of major hurdles uh, that have prevented us from creating such a vaccine. And one is the virus around the world is different. So imagine you go every year to the doctor to get a flu shot. Not, not everybody, but the ones that are supposed to go, uh, because they're at the risk uh, population. So you go to the doctor every year for a flu shot, because flu is so different every year from, from the next year that you think you need a flu shot uh, for influenza. Fact is, HIV is 100 times more variable than influenza. So this is a big challenge that we face of generating a vaccine that could protect everybody around the world. The other big challenge is that once HIV gets into your body, it goes into cells and it sleeps there. And we need to be able to get that virus out of the body, and we have not found any ways of doing that so in an infected individual. And lastly, uh, we also know that, that not everybody responds equally to the virus. There are people with a certain genetic background that can control the infection without taking drugs. And those are the people that we have been looking intensively uh, into and have studied how their immune response adds actually uh, can fight the virus and can make sure those people don't get sick and the virus doesn't grow in those people. And when we say we, I have some members actually of the team here, um, this is a big effort, not only local but an international effort, it costs a lot of money and we have studied over the last 20 years uh, cohorts in Peru, in South Africa, Barbados and other nice places uh, including some Asian countries, and we have tried to understand what is it that makes those people that can control the virus different from the people that cannot control the virus and the, those people that will progress to AIDS and ultimately death uh, within very few years or, or even within a year or two. So, and, and at the end of all this exercise, we have come up 
with data and, and experimental data from more than about 2,000 people across the world where we have now got an idea what we should be putting into a vaccine. And now we have created this vaccine, this is wonderful and beautiful, but we are lacking now the money to actually go further and testing this in the clinics. And I think that's the other, the fourth big hurdle if, for HIV vaccine development. To put it in context, the last vaccine that was tested in a large enough population was in Thailand. It was published in, in 2009, 2010. It cost more than $100 million to test the vaccine, at the end of which we saw a little reduction in the number of people that became infected. So $100 million later, and we don't really know any more than we knew back in 1984, when the US responsibles at the NIH said, well, no, HIV is now discovered in 1984. Within a few months, we're going to have a vaccine. Now, we are 30 years later, billions of dollars into it, and we still don't have a vaccine. And I think we're going to face a big challenge uh, still uh, to come up with a vaccine over the next few years. And at the same time, people start thinking there will never be a cure or HIV is a treatable disease, both of which is really detrimental to the further support of our work and, and, and the field as an entire uh, community that tries really to get a vaccine into people that could protect them over the years. And I think with this, I have exhausted my time. I'm Swiss. As you uh, say. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So, Christian, how was it you arrived to Barcelona? Because uh, I just mentioned you were teaching in in the US, but I d didn't mention that you arrived here eight years ago or so. Yeah, that started in Amsterdam. Uh, I was at a meeting, and instead of going with everybody else for smoking marijuana on the houseboats, I actually stayed in the hotel working on a grant. And that moment, somebody called me up from Barcelona and asked, hey, um, do you want to come to Barcelona? We have this opening here. We're looking for somebody to coordinate uh, the Catalan program for an HIV vaccine, which is a collaboration and, and a very unique collaboration, actually, between Irsi Kashab in, in Canruti in Badalona and the hospital clinic in Barcelona and funded by, by La Casa, uh, Steve and, and the public a hand as well. So it was a very unique opportunity to, to head a, a very potent program and to really try what, what I thought I would never be able to do uh, in Boston, uh, to actually push forward our own ideas on, on what a vaccine should look like. And what the vaccine should look like? Well, if, if you create or if you try to create a vaccine, um, you really you really need to decide which parts of, of a virus you put into the body. Mm -hmm. And you really need to understand, or at least try to understand as good as you can, what the immune response should look like to, mm -hmm. against those pieces. Uh, and so on both of those ends, we, we have been working to try to understand how HIV infected people combat their virus, how people who are frequently exposed to the virus but do not become infected how they deal with the virus, what their immune response is, and those uh, kind of information help us to select pieces of the virus and to transport and inject them into the body in a way that we think this, this specific kind of immune responses will be induced. You were explaining to me that uh, HIV virus is unique in the sense that if you would put the whole virus, like in other vaccines, it stimulates the inflammatory response and helps the virus to replicate. So how is So that? HIV needs an immune activation. The, the virus needs the body to be inflamed in order to grow in it. Um, because it can only say, enter into some specific cells to grow in it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think HIV has, over the years of, of transmission and evolution, learned how to make and generate an inflamed human, mm -hmm. uh, where it can grow better. And, and this is certainly the product of years and, and decades of evolution of the virus, if not century, when we go back into, into other species from where HIV has come. Because you also, I, it surprised me, my ignorance, that I, I thought HIV was recent, recent, I mean, let's say 40, 50 years old, but you said it's Oh, almost we are 100? recent with 50 years. We are young. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it, so HIV has certainly been in, in the animal 
uh, field before. There is the feline leukemia virus or feline uh, immunodeficiency virus uh, that infects big cats in, in, in Africa. Uh, there is SIV, the mm -hmm. monkey virus, that is the, the cousin to HIV, and from where uh, SIV has jumped into the human. And the earliest, if you start calculating back on evolutionary clocks, it's called, where you can measure evolution, speed, and, and from where it came, you can get back to about 1920s as, as one of the more or less well-documented first transmission. Uh, I, I think that transmission may not have given rise to the to the epidemic today. Uh, that may have been an event a little bit later on. Um, but I think the very scary and important part about it is that there is still new transmissions into the human of SIV, so the monkey wow. virus variants that can jump ever so often into humans. I don't want to say that the next HIV uh, type 3 epidemic is just waiting. But we have HIV-1, that's the one that has populated around the world. We have HIV-2, that is older and more centralized, less pathogenic. It doesn't kill so badly, uh, it doesn't transmit so easily. But there is a certain fear and, and the chance that we see another variant jump the species into the human. So that in, if we keep on counting, that would be HIV-3. And so. in terms of the vaccine, that would be a, a huge challenge. I mean, if you create a vaccine for one type, I think it would be a, a good challenge. Um, at the same time, we, we shall not forget, if I say that HIV is so enormously variable, it still needs to, it cannot mutate endlessly. Uh, HIV needs to, what we refer to as an evolutionary window, it needs to exist in some of this range, otherwise it would no longer be HIV or it would die itself off. So. A next version still needs to obey a few rules. Uh, not every SIV virus could infect a person. So there will be a certain bottleneck, a certain selection of viruses that could come into the humans, and, and hopefully a vaccine could still partially be effective against those. But this is really, I don't want to scare now and say, <laughs> oh, the, the next epidemic is coming, you know. But, but there's a certain risk, yeah. You also told me about the 1% of population who is resistant genetically. Mm -hmm to the virus. So those are the people that we have especially uh, studied in, in, in great detail, those controllers or elite controllers. Um, these are people that have a specific set of genes that interestingly also makes them much more suitable to develop autoimmune diseases. Oh. So we have the people that, that suffer from, from common autoimmune diseases are actually the ones that control HIV the best. And, and I think the immunological basis of this uh, is, is something we are very much interested in studying. I could ask you many, many, many other things, but I think it's the time for the audience mm -hmm. to ask questions. So if there is somebody here with a question for Dr. Brander, so this is the time. There is a question from somebody here. It says, once you achieve the, uh, the you, when I'm reading how it was written, how, once you achieve the va vaccine, which is a result that all of us would this uh, with what all of us would decide. What do you want to do next once you have the vaccine done? Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, yeah, no, we jokingly say in the afternoon we're going to cure hepatitis C. Um, so uh, I think hepatitis C is a big challenge out there, of course. Uh, tuberculosis is a huge problem, malaria is another one, and, and uh, I, I will not be fit to study any of those. Um, maybe a little bit of hepatitis C, but uh, I really think we need to focus on, on HIV for a few more years. And also, going back to the vaccine, a vaccine, I mean, once you have it, there, are, there is a long period of testing and trying. How is that? How long could it take to be yeah, ready? I, I cannot really give you a, a number of years. Uh, we, we try to refrain from that. Um, also, I've been given the advice that you should always say five years, because after five years, everybody has forgotten what you said. <laughs> but that, that's really uh, you know, a cynical joke. But um, this is like any drug product. Mm -hmm. you, you, you conceive an idea, you test it preclinically in, in animals, uh, you think the data is good enough, you convince a few big pockets to, to give you the money, 
uh, we are at this stage, luckily now, that we can produce vaccines. Uh, we have two, three mm, prototypes that, that, that we are actually you know, producing the vials now, and, and hopefully next year they go into the human in, in clinical trials. And then you need to have a clinical trial phase one. You need to make sure this thing doesn't kill people or that makes them terribly sick. From there you need to go into phase two, that's another two years. Then you need to go into phase three, that's another few years. And from there you may get then market authorization where you can actually start selling the thing. Uh, so that's, you know, process of many, many years added up. Uh, that's like any drug product, you know, the big drugs that, that you take today that they have been conceived 10 years back. So. Of course, safeness. I mean, the uh, especially safety, you need safety. to make sure. I mean, we just had this case in France, no, where, where uh, two, I think one person died and, and a few were more hospitalized uh, after participating in, in a phase <coughs> one trial. And, and this and is also, absolutely necessary. But there is a sense, kind of a sense of, of urgency to find this vaccine, no? because of also the changes in, in our society, how fast uh, yeah, I think uh, we things shall not, can be transmitted. Yeah, that, that's why I try to make sure, you know, or remind everybody HIV is being transmitted, HIV kills nowadays. Uh, most of the people of the 35 million people, the large, large majority, do not have access to treatment because it's simply too expensive. I just had to present some data out of Lesotho. Lesotho has 2 million inhabitants and has an annual budget of health care of $50 million. Oh, wow. That makes exactly $25 per person for the full year. So uh, for, for $25, to to you just walk into a hospital clinic and, you know, asking for the way. So this doesn't go anywhere and just certainly not go to effective treatment. And, and I think people need to be very well aware that, that treatment is not accessible for everybody. And, and this is, is the really urgency for finding a vaccine because only a vaccine will be affordable and sustainable to protect everybody globally. And how affordable would that be? Because the, we are in the problem with the pharmaceutical companies that probably the vaccine is ready, but it's too expensive for the poor that, countries. Yeah, that will not happen. Uh, the political, uh, on any pharma uh, that is able and lucky enough to get a good vaccine going, uh, that will be an enormous political pressure uh, to get this vaccine out. So once it's known that we have a vaccine, if, if the political pressure is not enough to make sure people or the pharma does this to affordable prices, they will be within minutes uh, generic us. Uh -huh. And uh, that's, that's, I think, totally okay. Well, yes, uh, morally. You know, I, I mean, you see, well, you know, yes, uh, I've, I have been using research funds for, for 20 years in, in that this, this direction, and they come from public hands, but maybe also some from private, private. funders. Uh, and investors, and, and of course the investors need a return. So I think we should not demonize pharma uh, just because they want to make a profit. They mm -hmm. also have a high risk, and, and this needs to have a balance. And it's interesting how here in Catalonia today, we could gather all these efforts, we, I mean, you, the, the IRSI Caixa, you could gather private investors and also Many millions. How was that? Is this recent that you were? Yeah, no, we had it? we had very good people around us who were able to mobilize this money. So uh, it was very little us, uh, but uh, yeah, we were lucky enough to find investors who believe in our idea, and and who are willing to take the risk, at some return in the future, of course. So I understand now much better the investor side too, because yeah. we currently could not move ahead with our vaccine development if we didn't have this. And we are this, talking about million. millions. Yes. Yeah, millions. Yeah. So thank you yep. very, very oh, much, it's Christian. This is you. a pleasure to talk to you and to know these uh, good hopes for the future. Thank you.